kind of dance moves. Sorry, that, that, that's that's the extent of them. I'm trying to give you something humorous for Laura to cut the uh, cut the intro and. Um, <laughs> Guys, Sean for the Good Dog, how is everybody doing? It seems like it's been a million years since we've checked in with each other, and it's been a, it's been longer than we like, uh, truth be told. Um, anybody who was watching or looking for the show, watching for the show, and or looking for the show, knows that it wasn't on last week, and we've only missed like a teeny, teeny, an itsy bitsy bit of episodes in the uh, last handful of years we've been doing them. Um, we've been pretty good, I'm pretty proud of, of our record, um, but I was in New Orleans and I was shooting, uh, recording, I would say shooting, recording the audiobook and it took way longer than we expected and so I uh, had to prioritize and I'm sorry, the show had to like, the show had to be on hold while we made sure that we got the um, got the audiobook done right and um, so I had to prioritize time for that so sorry but but I think our record's still pretty good I mean if, if, if we were like if we were baseball players and like God you know I go into deep water it's like trying to like make baseball analogies because I don't know crap about it but um, if we were a baseball player a hitter and we were let's say out of these three years we've missed three episodes we're like Babe Ruth territory, right? Hopefully, something like that. You know, Babe Ruth hit a lot of home runs and, and, and uh, was kind of like the dude. So um, I'm just going to compare us to that, um, regardless of whether that has any validity or not. It's really kind of beside the point. Anyways, so uh, thanks for bearing with all of this silliness that's unrolling. It's been, it's been too long, guys. I've, I've forgotten how to interact and how to engage with you guys uh, in a coherent, in intelligent way. Um, had an awesome time in New Orleans um, shooting the book, once again, shooting the, I'm just going to go with it, shooting the book was incredibly challenging, um, a lot of fun, but way harder than I ever expected. Um, Michael, it's so hard to say his last name, uh, Zients. Michael Zients with Airlift Productions um, in New Orleans. Uh, it's also the same place we did our DVD overdubs, <clears throat> voiceover stuff. He is a dreamboat of a dude and so patient and so good and helped work through any kind of typos or chromatical issues that were in the, in the printed version and uh, helped make sure that the audio version was nailed down and like right on the money. So patient, like so incredibly patient. He should be knighted. If we lived in another country, we'd, we'd, we'd you know, put them up for nighting. Anyways, so thank you, Michael, if you happen to see this. Um, but boy, do I have mad, mad props, daps, and, and a hell of a lot of credit going out to anybody who does audiobook stuff on the, on the, on the regular because uh, I was so sure I was in for like a week vacation in New Orleans, like slide in for like four to six hours. You know, like I think it was four hours. Like two to six was our schedule supposed to be for four days. I was like, oh, this is gonna be so easy. Get, hit the gym, have a little bit of red beans and rice, ride the bike around, do this. Man, that went out the window like after the first day and I was like, oh crap, we're way behind schedule. We need more days, we need more hours. And so everything kind of like got focused on that along with training Bella, who was the uh, dog reactive dog down there. So, uh, or dog reactive and cat reactive dog. So had my hands full, lots of stuff going on. Um, but always, 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 I'll say it one more time, always amazing to be in New Orleans, I'm always super happy there, and I'm I, and I know some of you have mentioned it that uh, in like Instagram stories, excuse me, and other places, like man, you seem so happy there, because I am, I really enjoy it down there. So um, slowly moving more and more of my time down there. Um, the team down there is growing, the business down there is growing, um, things are really coming along 
fabulously down there. So, so that's super great news. The team here is building. Um, we've brought Liz on. Liz came here as an intern and just like decided to tear the joint apart and kick ass. And um, what an incredibly quick learner, uh, self-starter, um, very intuitive, uh, likes to learn by watching. And um, not that she's opposed asking questions, but I can tell she's just she's just processing and analyzing and so Liz has joined the team she was actually supposed to be here for three months and then head out to uh, Colorado and um, and rejoin her business that she had out there and she decided she wanted to stay on with us how cool is that because she is such a badass and what she brings between like the odd couple of like Henri you know and Liz is is fabulous also personality wise they balance out each other really really well we've also got Tara who's out here a couple of days a week um, and she's uh, offering a ton of great stuff uh, to the team as well so got that going on we've got a new intern coming in so we're gonna be chock full bursting at the seams Coralie Evelcu uh, is coming in and she is going to be spending three months with us all the way down from Canada and uh, we're looking forward to having her here because she's an awesome lady and uh, I think she's gonna learn a lot here at the good dog LA so let me just check my notes let me make sure I've covered everything <sighs> notes were audiobook adventurous we covered that. It was adventurous. Audiobook coming soon. We didn't cover that. Audiobook is coming soon. It's being, uh, for, it's already formatted. Um, we've already got it together, all the files and everything. It's already mastered and all that tech stuff. But um, as far as getting it to where it's available for sale, purchase, and that kind of package to be downloaded, that's in the process right now. And I can't wait. I think you guys are going to be blown away. It's like, it sounds so damn good. Like, oh, I'm just, I can't believe it's, can't believe it's me. Um, so coming soon, we'll let you guys know. Um, there'll definitely be a lot of noise when, when that finally hits. Um, but I'm thinking sooner rather than later. I don't think there's a lot standing in the way. I'm thinking, I kind of set a goal for myself um, by the end of this month, beginning of June. I mean, beginning in July, don't tell Laura. Um, hopefully she's not seeing this part um, for the edit. Um, but I really think that we can make that happen if, if all goes right and there's no big technical snafus. So let's shoot for end of July for the audiobook and then uh, I'll announce pricing and all that stuff, but it's gonna be bomb diggity. Um, bunch of trainers are giving out the book to um, their clients um, for go home sessions and pre go home sessions. Um, like. I'm super honored, super blessed. I cannot believe it. We've got all of these trainers messaging us, asking for, you know, like ordering in bulk boxes and boxes of the books to be given to their clients. So I, I, I just, you know, we just did our thing, you know, and, and you know, little, 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 little ideas and little, uh, posts and little tips and things that have a lot of love and a lot of thinking and pondering and, and questioning behind them and then a lot of effort and action to bring them to life and then next thing you know they end up in a book somewhere and helping people. So even like, you know, by the way, this whole book was written on a phone. Two thumbs wrote that whole book. Um, of course, it was typed on a computer into the files, but the way I wrote it, I wrote the entire book in my bed um, or sitting at a cafe on my phone. This one that's filming right now, two thumbs. You can write a book with two thumbs, just in case anybody wanted to know. Um, UK seminar, me and Jeffrey Gelman, um, only I'm allowed to call him Jeffrey, and I think Linda. Um, Headed out to the UK, there's been a lot of trauma and drama and like, can they make it and people trying to shut us down. It's been, you guys have heard the ongoing odyssey of this. Um, we finally got a property all staked out um, in London. Scotland is, you know, in Glasgow is perfect. Um, I think we're in Eastbourne now, um, which is just right outside of, uh, right outside of London and cool, cool spot, great property and it's gonna jam and, but, you know, a lot of people have been pressured and scared and freaked out, I think, into not showing up or being concerned about, you know, if they showed up, would they catch any heat, things like that. So I want to encourage anybody 
who's looking to work with us and is on the fence and is like, oh man, I'm, you know, anybody who's worried, do what's best for you and your dog and screw, screw the pressure, screw the herd, screw the tension or screw the, screw the, screw the friction and the judgment and the criticism and, and the bullying going on from anybody. If you want to come see us in a situation that we're probably not going to get to do very often, um, I'd hate to see you miss an opportunity to do that um, because of outside pressure from a bunch of bozos that you know don't have your best interest or your dog's best interest in mind. So not to get nasty like right out of the gate on the, uh, on the show, but that's the truth. We're leaving, uh, I think I'm flying out to Providence on the uh, 26th, 27th, something like that. Um, and then we're gone for about two weeks. Uh, let's talk about film crews coming out to shoot uh, and a few other surprises while we're out there. So it's going to be a big deal. If you want to join us, there's still tickets available and it's going to be special. So rvdogtrainer.com, rvdogtrainer.com. And no, we won't be taking an RV over to England. And I know I've said that before. So sorry if I have to use the same old tired joke. Anyways, that's it. Let's jump into the show. Let's get this baby rolling. Okay, here we go. Ready? Hey everybody, it's Sean from The Good Dog. And to the left of me is not Laura Morgan. She's back home and she's going to be answering her own questions and we'll be cutting and ed- or cutting slash editing. That's the same thing. Uh, the show, um, everything you can't see, Belle over here, Manny over here, uh, my alignment of drinks, first water, second six shot cappuccino, and smidge of wine. I really, I like, I I may not even drink all of them, but I like having the options. I like, if I need to wet my whistle, if I need a little pep, if I need just a little, so, so that's the selection going on. Anyways, all of this stuff you can't see and some of the stuff that you can't see make up the Good Dogs Q&A Saturday episode number 138. That sound. All right, let's get on the show. Okay, guys. Hi, how are you? I miss you guys. Um, he's sleeping, so I'm gonna jump right in. Um, I feel like I have nothing really to update with you guys with. It's just the same old thing. The baby's getting teeth, which is awesome. The baby's sleeping through the night, which is awesome. Um, finally. And the baby's six months. I I don't really have anything else. I mean, I'm not around. I hung out with um, Henri and Liz the other day. We had Indian food, which is super fun. Um, I went with Henri to look at cars, and that was super fun. So that's my TGD experience. But I'm not really around as much anymore. So unfortunately, I have nothing else to talk to you guys about. But I do love you very much, and um, I continue to have dogs in my life all the time. And I continue to have you guys in my life. And I really appreciate you guys putting up with all this stuff. And I know I always say that, but you know, this is kind of like a semi-maternity leave for me, but I still like to have a check-in with you guys every week. So I really appreciate you guys bearing with us and I hope we still answer everything for you that you're looking for. Um, Okay. Question number one comes from Raquel. Raquel says, Buzz is a very people phobic collie and has been very leash reactive. With work, this is 95% better, but he still freaks out when someone comes past that he hasn't seen, like out of a door or a passageway. Any idea how we can tidy up this last little bit? Take it away. Okay, 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 okay. Let's see which which one. I will go water. Okay, and, and my apologies, by the way, there was, was it last episode where my mic was clanging against my um, Florida Lee and I didn't notice it until the show was done. I felt so bad because it was just like, uh, I, I was like, I was so annoyed with it and I can only imagine how annoying it was for you guys. So I tried to make sure that we have no clanging going on. So 
let me know, okay? All right, so this one comes from Raquel from Facebook, from The Good Dog, um, The Good Dog, what's the name of our business? The Good Dog Training and Rehabilitations Facebook page. Um, she's got a reactive dog she's been working with for a long time, working really hard, doing a lot of great stuff, and is saying that her dog is 95% better. But as human nature, she'd like to see if there's a way to improve it. She says, um, let's see if I'm not mistaken, because uh, I'm not writing up full notes, we're, we're kind of taking the show a little bit more loose. Um, I think when, when, when human beings step out and surprise uh, the dog, the startle the dog, that there, she's still getting a response of startle. She's still getting a response, response of reactivity where all the other like dog and human reactivity where the dog can see it and has time to digest and she can address, that's all looking rock solid. But there's still this tiny little percentage when the dog is startled. So what do we have to say about that? Good question. Okay, so first of all, 95% is pretty damn good and Make sure you celebrate that. So, don't just let don't 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 you dare just let that ninety five percent progress like just fade fade away into like accept not acceptance. What's the word? Um, taking it for granted. Ninety five percent progress is amazing. So you've done some really really awesome work and really brought your dog a long way. So I just like like to encourage you to celebrate it because I know it's su super easy for all of us to get into the space of like, well, there's still this and we're working on it. And, and it's great that you're still working on it. Make sure you celebrate the 95% because that's freaking awesome. Um, as for the other 5%, you could be fighting against genetics, right? Startle response, things like that. There are plenty of dogs, like even Manny. So my guy, Manny, who's like bomb proof, 100% safe with people, 100% safe with dogs. Um, he's a, a rock star for all intents and purposes, but he has a startle response. Um, I don't know if it comes from earlier stuff. I don't know if it comes from him being a naughty dog when he was younger, because he was a naughty dog from, from what I've heard his story. And um, so I don't know if that created stuff or if he just has a kind of natural predisposition to, um, to uh, startle response stuff. But regardless of that, I guess my point is that he's an amazing dog that most people would die to have because he's so easy and good and fun and safe and all that but yet you rattle a bag around him or something happens that he's not sure about or he thinks like whoa am i going to get corrected or is this something i don't know about or whatever and you'll get an extreme overt unnecessary startle response and he's that's him grumbling and he's awesome so i just wanted to put that out there um, we've seen lots of dogs that have come through here that, that have done the full program and have made amazing improvements and are fantastically well-trained. State of mind is in a completely different space, but they still have a startle response. They still have a genetic predisposition to being a little more fragile in that department. A little, just like I'm sure we all know people that spook easier than others, you know? Some folks, you, you, you can like hide behind a door and try and spook them and they're like, right? Think about that. I mean, I think that's a good example. I hadn't even really thought about it until I just said it. Then there's other people, you spook them a little bit and they like pee their pants and they get mad at you and, and you know, it becomes a big thing and it really scares the crap out of them. Um, we all have different kind of set points of where we sit with being startled and our kind of foundational security and stability dogs have the same stuff and so want to keep trying to move them forward and improving them while also maintaining some some connection and checking in with reality that your dog may be doing an amazing amazing job and still have this stuff going on and that doesn't mean he's not doing his best and it doesn't mean you're not doing your best it just means that there might be some genetic stuff cooking here. So can it improve? Hard to say. Maybe slowly over time, a little bit. You asked, you know, what would you do? Um, 
there's really not much else you can do except for trying to be Johnny on the spot, correcting for freakouts. So you let him know, I don't want any more of that. That may help or it may not do anything. You may correct and have that moment actually like de-escalate, but it may not give you any long lasting uh, changes in, the, in those choices or those behaviors because the emotional set point for that might be so high or so intense or so fragile that even even training, even correcting, even trying to let the dog know that I do not want that still may be something that the dog's not able to manifest even though you want it really bad and maybe the dog wants it really bad too. So I hope that helps. Celebrate the 95%, the 5%, keep working on it, but don't let it eat away at you. Don't let it eat away at your dog and your relationship. And remember that we all got baggage and um, 5% some startle here or there. Not that I'm giving a pass and saying like, don't work on it. Just saying, keep it in perspective. It's super important stuff. Um, you've done great work and um, yeah, I think it's a good place to leave it. Okay, this question is for me and I'm gonna answer it somewhere else, um, but I'll ask it here. Question number two comes from Marco. Marco says, hey guys, I'm in need of some help regarding recall. I have a very confident, pushy 52 kilogram sure what that is. I think it's like a hundred something pounds Rottweiler. Um, I have changed the overall structure and routine with place and crates inside to structure play and obedience work coupled with accountability. We're getting great improvements. I send in the question about healing which was answered on oh yeah on 137. Oh yeah he was pushing the heel a little bit. Um, his thresholds are good. No bursting and pushing past them even if he does get excited and he's become smart enough not to go too far ahead for the 180s on the prong which worked great and his focus definitely became on me after the 180s. He edges forward but he limits himself with his shoulder next to me on uh, next to my knee but I will try it with the e-collar and keep working on it. Cool, great for you. Um, I've practiced recall in the protocol from place to place then from down to place near me finally transitioning to recall to me within our backyard and now it's time to transition outside for proofing. His recall drops dramatically. Once he gets the break command, that seems to be his cue to find every scent possible and mark everything possible. And this is where the problem begins. If he's casually walking around and not scent distracted after the break, his recall's great. If he finds something interesting, he will blow through a hundred on the mini. Okay, one of those. No matter if I'm close by or not, he finishes his marking then recalls. Do I need to do more, more work on close recall outside, more patterning, perhaps before he puts his nose to the ground? His motivation for food, praise, or a toy is next to nil in these circumstances, so I feel his reward for listening is purely not getting corrected. Thank you again for helping me fine tune all of these little hurdles. Okay, great question. Take it away, Laura. <laughs> yes. You love that? Okay. Okay, guys. So I essentially moved from the bed to the baby. And yes, he's definitely growing up. Um, he loves the phone. All he wants to do is grab the phone. Take the phone. Okay. So this question is an awesome one. Now, I don't want to say that your mini educator is not strong enough, but your mini educator is probably not strong enough. And what's interesting is that when I answered the question, was it me that answered it or at least I asked it? No, I think I answered it. Your, your last question on 137 about the heel was my, this is, this is such a lesson, but like my gut told me that maybe your e-collar wasn't strong enough because you were so thorough in how much you'd done the training and the thresholds and all this stuff. And it seemed like the dog kept pushing, kept pushing, even at some higher levels. So I was like, gosh, I feel like he might need a bigger collar, but that's not a conclusion you want to jump to first off. So that wasn't something I was going to be like more power because that's what gives e-collars a bad name is people thinking that people just, you just jump to the conclusion of you need a higher level. Definitely, definitely not the case always. Sorry for the flyaways. Um, but here's the deal. You have a very strong breed dog, right? And he's also got a strong will. So it's easy like, 
you know, he's out in the yard and he's sniffing and you're like, okay, well maybe I need to pattern more because I'm calling him and he's not coming my way. Um, maybe I need more shorter distance recalls, maybe all that. Yes, you definitely should keep doing all that. I don't remember in the question if you mentioned how long you're actually have been training these recalls in the backyard. Um, but I have a feeling you're just so thorough that you probably have done a good amount of work so far. So that tells me that you're not being lazy, you're not being sloppy with training him, you're not like, oh, let me do recalls for two days and then why isn't he listening to me? It seems to me that you're probably going through the program pretty thoroughly and that he might just not really care about the stim. You said even at 100. And now that is something that like, like we've said before, 99% of the dogs that come through the good dog are on a mini, mini educator. They learn at like a level five to 10. They end up correcting at like a level 15 to 20. Some dogs are higher level corrections. Some dogs have a higher level correction and they come down. And then there's some dogs like your dog and like Cujo and like some other dogs that come in that just have super strong will, they just don't care. Of course they care, they don't like it, they don't like the feeling of a hundred, but it's not enough to have that lasting impression, which is so important, something that I just feel so strongly about. It's not about you spending the rest of your life correcting your dog. It's about creating correction that actually has some lasting results that actually the dog goes, oh, when I hear my name, I know I'm supposed to come. I'm not even just, I'm not just gonna listen to the caller all the time. He agrees. Um, I'm going to listen to it all the time because I had a correction that actually meant something to me. So then for the rest of my days, except for a few reminders, I'm kind of in the, in the mode of actually listening and doing what I'm supposed to do. So again, long story short, basically, I think you need to get a bigger collar. I think you need a more powerful collar. I think you should get a Boss 800. You can probably sell your mini educator on you know, Craigslist or eBay or whatever, or maybe we could sell it for you, um, or you can offer it up to one of our, our, uh, our viewers and see if they want to buy it used. Um, it was a great, it's a great collar for some dogs to start on, but once they kind of get the program and if they're strong-willed and they're strong dog and all that stuff, sometimes you need to go up. And what I'm mostly concerned about is just the headroom that you want to have. So if your dog is just not recalling because of a smell or because he wants to mark something and he doesn't care about 100 for that, good luck if he sees a squirrel or sees something that he wants to chase or sees something that he really doesn't want to come back to you and you're in a situation where you're not in an enclosed yard. So you always want to have that headroom. He definitely agrees. Um, you want to have that headroom because maybe on the boss, he might listen to like a 30 and then you have all this room to go for any emergency situations. And it might go down after that 30 correction. He might be like, whoa, I get it now, you know, but you're going to have to mess with that yourself. But always a good idea. Yes always a good idea to continue practicing and doing more and more you know practice short distance all that stuff definitely do all that definitely do all that if you want to keep doing it before you decide to even go to a bigger collar too keep going keep doing those shorter distance recalls but my gut tells me that you need that higher power collar and it told me that the last time too um when i answered that question on the heel so two times two times is a charm fool me once can't get fooled again, I think you need a higher power collar. But keep practicing, keep patterning, make sure he knows everything fairly, and then order your Boss 800. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, back to me again. Question number three comes from Mabin. Mabin says, hey guys, we have a copy of your book and we're loving it so far. Awesome. I have a question. I hope you can share your views and thoughts on it. We have plenty of dog events here in Singapore. Most of them are dog gatherings, such as mass dog walks on leash in a park or off leash meetings in a small cafe. What are your views on attending events like this? Should we be avoiding these events? I've heard you mention a few times about never meeting on leash. Also, I'd like to know whether we should allow our friends to bring their dogs over into our home. Is it recommended for people to bring dogs that my dogs have not met or have briefly met into our home? Are there any danger of doing so? Or what are the precautions that we should take? Thank you. 
Take it away, Sean. Okay. Nice work, Miss Morgan. I trust nice work because I haven't heard your response yet, but she always, she's always got the good answers. So, um, okay. So on to me. So we've got Maven. Maven just ordered our book and said some really nice things. So Maven, thank you very much. I really, really appreciate it. We really appreciate it. And uh, just once again, blown away by how many people were already on our, excuse me, we're already on our second printing and uh, it's just going. Okay, um, Maven's got some questions. I think Megan, uh, Megan, Maven is in uh, Singapore. If I'm not mistaken, I'm sorry about this. Like, I just haven't had time to take care of this thing. Um, she's talked about a lot of dog events, big dog events, like a lot of dogs hanging out, um, meetups at parks, um, walks, um, cafes, outdoor events like that, where a lot of dogs are together. And, uh, you know, a lot of owners kind of use it, I'm sure, as a, so, as a social hang, but also as a, an opportunity for dogs to be around each other and things like that. So, so we've got dog events, meetups, um, and then she's got one other question I'll get to at the end. So her question was, is it okay? What do you think, Sean, about these dog events? It's an interesting question, and, and it's... it's it's one you wouldn't find me at. Now, so let me qualify and explain that. You wouldn't find me at it because, for one, just socially, I would be like overwhelmed by all those people and all those dogs. Um, but two, I don't know how much value there is in having all these dogs around each other. Right now, a lot of people are like, "Well, it's socialization, and it's really valuable for dogs that are reactive to be around other dogs and things like that." The most important thing, as far as making progress with dogs that are reactive or uncomfortable around other dogs, are making sure that you've got the right tools and approach and training, and that you control your dog yourself and the environment, and ensure that your dog learns to manage itself and feel safe and comfortable in your charge. Now, at a big event like this, could you have trouble with that? Could that be a problem? Could you run into pulling, lunging dogs, barking dogs, nervous dogs? I mean, if you're talking about big groups like you are, chances are extremely high that there's a lot of stuff going on. Now, if you've got like a Manny or a Bell, like a bomb-proof dog, and, and you wanna go hang out at these things, and it's more about just like the hang, then there's really no big deal. If it's, a, if it's a situation that's more about, I'm trying to make better progress with my dog. Um, I'm trying to get my dog more comfortable around other dogs. I'm trying to get my dog more socialized. I'm trying to get my dog to be more comfortable in large groups of unpredictable situations. For that, that wouldn't be my choice. I would find that to be counterproductive because you're going to be around a lot of most likely ill-behaved dogs. So. You want to, and, and this doesn't mean that like your dog can only be around well-behaved dogs to improve, but like a caboodle of badly behaved dogs, I'm going to assume, just because that's what happens when a bunch of people get together with a bunch of dogs, you always have a bunch of knuckleheads. So it's something to be really conscious of. Your question is, do I, what do I think about it? So I, I shared my answer. My answer is I wouldn't be there. Um, even with my bomb proof dogs, but if I had a reactive dog, I certainly wouldn't be there. I would be going out in real world situations, which are not 50, 60 dog like collaborations and walking the streets of my neighborhood, walking the streets in my area and working my dog around normal real life situations and teaching my dog what kind of behaviors I want in a situation that's a little bit more controllable with dogs that are not overwhelming and chaotic and things like that. So. That's, that's the first answer. You'll have to make the determination. You'll have to judge. If your dog is solid enough, up to you. If your dog is nervous and insecure and you're trying to make the dog better, I would suggest don't do it. Um, let's see, ba, 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 ba. You talked a little bit about, um, you know, it's like meet and greet kind of stuff. <clears throat> Belle, please don't fall into the 
into the tripod. She's so precariously placed. Oh, she jumped on the couch. Excellent. Um, so we never, ever, ever encourage meetings on leash because we get tons and tons of clients that show up on that couch over there that have had that go down. You know, they might have even might have even had many meetings that were great, and then all of a sudden, one, two, three, or just one bad meeting goes down and now your dog doesn't trust you or other dogs and now you've got reactivity and dog aggression stuff going on. That, it really is born out of that stuff oftentimes. So it's that sensitive. Your dog can get like roughed up and nailed in one like nose to nose interaction and be like, forget dogs. I'm not letting them get anywhere near me. From now on, I'm barking and growling at every dog. So super important to think about. Um, your job, obviously advocate and protect your dog at all times. That is your highest priority if you want your dog to be non-reactive and give you great stuff. And that's, I've talked about this before. I've, I've written about it and I, I think I've talked about, it, talked about it on Q and A and that I call it the deal. And that's really the deal. The deal is if I'm gonna ask my dog to not be reactive, you can't be reactive. You've gotta behave yourself. Then my end of the deal is I have to protect you and prevent you from being put in a situation that you cannot win in. I have to ensure that I hold up my end of the bargain, which is making sure that other dogs don't get too close to you, people don't crowd you, and you're well behaved, and that I ask the best of you and I manage myself. So that's the deal. The, the deal isn't like you can't be reactive and I'm gonna go put you in high pressure situations that you can't win in and that you mess up in and then I'm mad at you. That's, that's an unfair deal. So if we're gonna ask this high level from our dogs, you better be ready to ask the same high level of yourself in order to have that happen with your dogs. Um, okay, what else we got here? Um, and then her last question, uh, Maven's hitting us up a lot for a lot of info. Um, she was asking about having friends' dogs over and if that's okay. So um, once again, I don't have a ton of context here as far as like what Maven's dogs are like personally, so, um, or dog. And if you've got a dog that's highly social, very relaxed, very easygoing, happy-go-lucky, that kind of like rare dog, and your friends have similar dogs, have at it. It's probably just gonna be a lot of fun, a little doggy rodeo, some chaos, and a little bit of madness, no big deal. If your dog's nervous, insecure, not sure about other dogs, or your dog is happy-go-lucky and cool and a rock star, but your friend's dogs are nervous, insecure, and unsure about other dogs, bad thing, bad setup. It's not about whether you bring them over to your house. It's about that you're creating an environment where you're going to put dogs together that have a high likelihood of not feeling comfortable around each other with not enough guidance and leadership about this is how you should behave and not enough being advocated for this is how you shouldn't behave towards this dog and things like that, right? So anytime you're talking about creating interactions and having dogs socialize or be around each other off leash, it's really, 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 really on you to make sure that everybody behaves themselves. It's like having a bunch of kids over for a party, making sure nobody's being a bully, making sure no one's headlock is a little too tight, making sure that no dog is pushing the other dog's buttons and the other dog is worried and concerned about it and no one's doing anything. Oh, it's so cute, look at their playing. Well, the other dog's terrified. That's not cool. So it really comes down to your dog and it comes down to your friend's dogs. They are, if they're all rock stars, have at it. If either party is not a rock star, it's probably going to be a negative situation where, and if you're thinking, well, maybe they can become friends, it's <clears throat> most likely gonna be a negative situation unless you really like are putting on your dog trainer hat and, 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 and negotiating and navigating that situation at the highest level of structure, rules, accountability, leadership, dogs on leashes, let me show you guys how to behave and this is what I want, this is not okay, and you know, that's just really hard for most people that haven't spent a lot of time studying it. So that's a long drawn out answer. I hope that helps. I hope it helps some other folks also who are thinking about like 
dog parties, big dog events, big pack walks, nothing wrong with big, big, big pack, big pack walks. Just make sure that the dogs that are on those walks or in those walks are well behaved and on the right tools and safe. Okay, um, so that is it, Maven. I'm clocking out and we're moving on to uh, Miss Laura's question. So Laura, take it away. Okay, question number four comes from Amber. Amber says, when a client leaves a dog with a muzzle on, how do you get the muzzle and prong collar on and off the next few days without an issue? Ooh, this is a great one. Laura, I know you have something good to say. Okay, Amber, this is a great question. Um, thanks Laura for reading the question, it's weird, I'm back with the baby, he's still on the swing, <laughs> he loves seeing himself, he's really into it. Um, so this is an interesting one for me to answer just because when I was working more hands-on at the Good Dog, I didn't do as much work with the tough guys, um, I never really did. Uh, well, I did, but like if there's a dog with a muzzle that we had to transition off of a muzzle and all that stuff, that was definitely what we call a Sean dog. Um, but I, I, I know exactly how it, how it goes. I just, I hope that I'm the best one for the job. I'm of course the best one for the job. I just feel a little bit maybe self-conscious. So um, here's the deal. So if you have a dog on a muzzle that comes in, the most important thing about having a dog on a muzzle when they come into your board and train or come in for training is that the dog is muzzle conditioned, right? This means that the dog actually takes food out of the muzzle, actually doesn't like try to fight the muzzle and try to paw it off all the time, but actually like the owners worked with the dogs um, for, for hopefully for weeks so that when the muzzle is put on, the dog can actually like eat out of the muzzle and then put it on and is fine with it on. So the goal of that is obviously like I said, not so the dog doesn't try to paw it off all the time, but also so that you have some smooth, um, you can actually work with the muzzle with the dog. So the dogs that come in, 99% of the dogs that come in that are muzzle conditioned are safe to have the muzzle come on and off because they're not like, they're not fighting it. They're not like, it's not like you have to like hold their head to like put it on. They're just used to it and you can feed them out of it and that sort of thing. So the whole thing is that you have the muzzle, you have the owner who's done it over and over. They've fed, there's a muzzle conditioning video. If you, if you YouTube Josh Moran muzzle conditioning, there's a video there. That's what we send to our clients and it teaches them how to actually feed the dog through the muzzle and get the dog used to it. So then the dog isn't stressed on it. And then as the time, as time goes on in your board and train, you're going to do the same sort of stuff where you're taking the muzzle off when the dog goes in the crate, um, putting the muzzle back on before you're putting on the tools, right? Any prong collar, e-collar, anything like that, anything with pressure, you want the dog to definitely be muzzled. It absolutely, especially if you don't know the dog and especially if it has a predilection to um, chomping, then you definitely want to have the muzzle on um, for any sort of intimate interactions that you're doing with the dog. Um, now, the other thing with the muzzle is that if you have a super, super dangerous dog and you don't feel comfortable yet or you haven't gotten a good read on the dog enough to be able to take the muzzle on and off and you haven't worked, worked with it like that, then there might be a situation where you need, need to talk to the owners and talk to them about the possibility of the dog wearing the muzzle inside the crate for a more extended period. Now, I'm not talking weeks. I'm not talking months. I may not even be talking days. I might be talking just like the whole first day that the dog comes into the board and train while you're getting used to them, while you're leading them out on a long line, while you're working with them in protocols for training stuff, and you don't feel comfortable taking the muzzle on and off. Now that's a situation you're gonna have to figure out. You're gonna have to talk to the owner about. You're gonna have to be like, you know what? I get a read on this dog that I don't wanna take the muzzle off right now, right away. I need to get more comfortable and start working with the dog more, creating a relationship through work before I actually start to, you know, pull the muzzle off and, and put it back on to be able to work and put tools on the dog. Um, some things that you can do if you are in a situation with a dog like that is have the owner put on the tools. If the dog's never worn tools, while the dog is muzzled, while the owner is still present, the owner can actually put on tools. So you can actually, you know, work 
e-collar or work prong collar the first day with the dog um, safely. Now, all of this that I'm saying right now, I realize um, I'm going kind of fast with it, but the reality is if you have dogs coming in for a board and train or a training situation that are on muzzle, that means that you should be have you should have been working with dogs like that a lot. So even just the question is can be concerning if it's like, hey, I have a dog with a muzzle on, like, how do I handle it? I know that's not your intention, but just for everyone else out there, if you are working with dogs that require muzzles, you definitely should have the kind of experience where you know how to read a dog right away, whether you feel comfortable taking on the muzzle, comfortable taking it off, all that stuff is in working with lots and lots and lots of dogs that have issues. So if you're, if you're unsure or if you're taking a dog way too soon that is way over your head, that's something that we definitely don't suggest. And I'm not saying that you're doing that, Amber. It's just more for the big, um, the big population out there that if you are a trainer and you're taking a dog way above your skill set, uh, probably not a good idea. That's how trainers get hurt and that's how trainers get burnt out because they get hurt or they get bit a lot. Trainers should not get bit. Um, that is definitely handler error. So all those things stand with the muzzle but also make sure that you're always working with dogs that are within your comfort zone. Um, and you know reading the dog is probably the biggest tool not just like knowing how to take a muzzle on and off but reading the dog and being able to you know go ah i feel comfortable or not so much not yet all right hope that helps okay nice work laura morgan as always okay nice work laura <laughs> I'm sorry, this is weird. Question number five comes from Lisa218, and she is on Instagram. She says, hi, Sean, you and Jeff both occasionally refer to the one percenter dog, like with leash reactivity. What specifically describes a one percenter, and how do I know if my dog is one? I have a four-year-old shepherd mix who's very smart and tricks obedience. He's on and off switch trained. He's made enormous progress in the two years I've had him. Prong and e-collar, including off-leash, structure, exercise, treadmill, second dog in the home, so he knows how to be great. Um, but he seems sort of genetically wired to be a nervous Nelly, mostly apparent when he's out in the world. If you put him down on a street corner for five minutes, he will quietly whimper on and off because moving even slowly is just safer. So while he's 90% better on the reactivity, he heals great, and she sees small progress, I guess I wonder if I should determine if this is basically as good as I should hope for or if I'm still missing something. I will add that I'm completely, add that the completely unexpected miracle game changer on walks has been a bonker. Well, it's something that's cumbersome to carry. He's been responded to it with the rare bark spin caught off guard freak fest with immediate calm behavior in the way that and e-collar corrections at any level have never achieved. The downside is observer, observers don't know what to make of you and give you a public shaming. I just, um, I delivered one not hard thwack at the start of a freak out and the man who was obliviously being walked a foot behind, 12 feet behind his flexi leaded dog, snapped to attention and yelled at me, stop hitting your dog. I really wanted to try a bonker on that guy, but I smiled and we walked calmly on instead. That's funny. Uh, sorry for the length. Thanks to you and Laura for all your help the last two years and for any details on the one percenters. Oh, it's a great, great question. Uh, take it away, Sean. So Leza had a gigantic question and I can't answer the whole question, Leza, because it's just, it's too gigantic and we will be here all night and um, this will be like a three hour mini series so we can't do that. But I wanna, I wanna address your main big juicy question that I think has value for everybody. And that was, you said you and Jeff Gelman, or Jeff G as you, as you stated, talk about um, one percenter dogs as far as reactivity on walks and could we explain what those one percenter dogs are? So, Manny, have some manners. He's like literally, he's laying on the cord to the light, which means he could unplug it at any second, and he's burping simultaneously. So like, no class and dangerous at the same time. Um, place, Manny. Hope, 
hopefully he'll stay there. Anyways, okay, so on to uh, Lazy's question. Um, so what does constitute a one percenter dog in the reactivity department? I'm sure everybody could have a different answer for that. But for me, it just means the extreme, extreme, extreme cases. And I think uh, Jeff would say the same thing. The one percenter dogs is just a term that we give dogs that don't respond typically to the tools and the training approach like most dogs, like 99% of dogs do or 95% of dogs or whatever the heck the number is. So the one percenters are those guys that are like the extreme, the most challenging, you know, um, and I've got a list of a few dogs I'll talk about, but these are dogs that, like I said, the, the typical tools for, for most dogs, let me, let me share this. For most dogs with reactivity and pulling and things like that, if you train them correctly with prong and e-collar and you go through the protocols and you actually do it right or you have a pro trainer help you out with it, almost all those dogs, their reactivity goes away within like a couple of days. And if you really know what you're doing, like you can keep it away and like create new habits and have a new dog as far as like, you know, in, you saw Bella's video in one week, well, actually in a couple, well, actually in a day, the next day we were out walking best dogs and she was great. So that's a more typical reactivity case. Right, typical reactivity case. And I'm not. I wasn't saying that to brag, but I was saying that because I'm. I'll get to that point later on about how quick that that changed. So, but it also points out to a more mild case. Um, uh, Bella's owners thought, wow, they thought she was on kind of the same level as like Peanut, that really reactive pity that did the big backflip in the first video, um, but nowhere near, nowhere near that kind of intensity. So. One percenters are dogs that don't respond in the typical fashion to the tools, to the training. Um, they typically reside at much, 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 much higher levels of arousal constantly on the walks, if not in the house. Um, getting them out of an aroused state is very, very challenging, whereas with most dogs, it's not nearly as challenging. So those one percenter dogs, they tend to with almost any kind of correction, any kind of addressing, lift up and escalate rather than de-escalate, which presents an awfully challenging situation because then you gotta find your, your doorway in, you gotta find your way. How do we get this dog to calm down, lose some of that arousal so we can actually train, teach the dog, and move the dog forward? So, challenging stuff, right? Um, let's see. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Yeah, I mean, I think I already covered, I talked about the arousal stuff. Um, I talked about the intensity. It's pretty obvious, I think, when you, if, if you were to look at that peanut video and see that kind of reactivity, I think that's, a, if, if anybody hasn't seen that video, just uh, just scroll down. I, I don't know if it's on YouTube uh, just yet. Scroll down, scroll down on my Facebook page um, or on, on Instagram um, and, and you'll see what, a, like a one percenter dog looks like because peanut is a one percenter dog peanut is a dog that's been through multiple trainers is on the best tools and with owners that are really trying and still was a major 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 challenge right so so let's think about the one percenters as kind of existing in this rarefied air of arousal intensity um escalating rather than de-escalating for corrections, things like that. Um, just just off the charts intensity, just wound tight like that and and ready ready to rock and roll at a split second. And 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 it, and in addition, there everybody says their dog goes from zero to a hundred in a second. But these one percenters, they go zero to a hundred or zero to a thousand in a split or half a second or a nanosecond. They're so fast. So that's part of the challenge. Um, okay, so along with that, let me tell you a couple stories. So I don't want this to go too long, but there was a dog named Scooter. And Scooter was a client of mine here in LA. And we did, uh, pretty sure that we did board and train. Uh, this is going back a ways. Um, board and train and then um, follow-up sessions and a few one-on-ones. 
and Scooter wasn't even supposed to be, this was like a, a foster dog, excuse me, and the owners um, or, or the, foster, the foster folks actually put a lot of money out to try and get Scooter into a good space. And they ended up falling in love with Scooter and wanted the best for him. And so we worked our butts off and it didn't matter what we did. I mean, could we get him? Did, did we improve his behavior? A ton. Did we get him to the place where you could walk him anywhere and not sweat it and not worry about it? No. He was still a dog you had to be on top of. And if you, if you missed a second, your goose was cooked. Um, and even if you didn't miss a second and the wrong dog came by, your goose could be cooked as well. So this dog ended up getting surrendered um, by the owners. Jeff uh, at that point was doing a surrendering program where people would pay a certain fee and he would take the dog for the life of the dog guaranteed and then train the dog and then try and find a good home or, or a, um, a, a, a good fit home-wise for the dog. Um, and so Scooter trained with us, right? This is good information for anybody who thinks there's magic out there. Like, oh my God, like Sean, if Sean works with a dog, it's gonna be great. Or if Jeff works with a dog, this dog went to me and then went to Jeff and stayed with Jeff for a long time. We would use Scooter at, at T3 uh, seminars whenever we had reactive dog classes. Whenever we were doing the reactive dog modules and we needed a dog to light all the other dogs up because we knew we'd be reactive, we'd bring out Scooter. And this is after Scooter trained with me and trained with Jeff and had gone through all the best stuff we had, still reactive. And, and, and not, not necessarily dog aggressive, um, good in the house and, and, and a lot of great, great qualities, but just on leash, just a freaking maniac. And so Scooter ended up, if I'm not mistaken, going to a place, you know, Jeff's thing was like, he shouldn't be walked. Uh, Jeff's a very practical guy. And he was like, here's a great dog, but walking him will be a nightmare for you. And uh, he went, if I'm not mistaken, and lives uh, on a property with lay, a lay, on a property with a lake, and gets to run around and do his thing. So he gets a lot of off-leash fun and, and stuff like that. But he doesn't do city walking. So that's a good example of a one percenter, like the best, you know, tools and training approaches and like hard ass work, and still trouble, still challenging. Um, Peanut, you guys saw Peanut's video, probably most of you. That's a one percenter dog. That's a dog that's whose intensity is off the charts. And we managed to make some incredible progress that I'm really, really proud of. But boy, did we like the whole team. I mean, you're talking about people that all they do is work on reactivity cases for the most part. And, uh, you know, have a lot of experience in bringing all these tools and skill sets to bear. Still working our butts off to try and get this dog to be in a space where it could walk by other dogs without creating explosive stuff and it was incredibly challenging so once again another one percenter dog um there's a dog i think it was named mika I, I think i have the name right this was back um bellflower back in north hollywood and mika was one of those dogs that just she came from a different spot she came from a place of i want to go see those dogs and no one's going to tell me i can't do it and so she wasn't fearful, nervous, insecure, whereas Peanut was fearful and, and insecure around dogs. Um, uh, Mika was more about, uh, I wanna go over there and no one's gonna tell me not to. So a lot of bratty, a lot of empowered, a lot of stuff like that. And we got her to the spot where, and it took, took time, took a lot of work, a lot of effort. We got her to the spot where she could hustle around with all of us on our team and have zero issues but getting her there was like literally, you know, climbing Mount Everest. It was incredibly tough. But her owners actually, who were looking to move on to a boat, and they were, they were looking to move on to a boat, I'm gonna try and keep this quick, looking to move on to a boat, but that meant they were gonna to have to come off the boat several times a day off the, the, the slip where they keep the boat to let Mika, um, I know I'm brutal, I'm totally like, you know, brutalizing her name. I'm sure it's something else. Um, let her off for potties and, um, and there'd be other dogs there. 
and every time they did once again the biggest challenge like getting getting rid of owner association environmental association and then owners being in a space where they're ready to be that assertive and change the relationship dynamic and the relationship perceptions that the dog has and being willing to do the hard ugly work that we had to do for the first two three four weeks in order to get the dog into a good space the owner might have to do it for two three four six months in order to turn that pattern around there's so much habit so much pattern emotional patterning built in it's how i feel around you it's what i do around you and um, they ended up giving up on getting the boat and stayed landlocked um, because even though mika did great with us back in their home environment she really struggled and they struggled to correct her and hold her accountable it was too hard for them and and i don't i don't I don't hold that against them. I understand how hard that is. I feel bad for owners when, they, when they've got a dog that is a one percenter because it's in a lot of ways a losing proposition or at least a proposition that means an incredible amount of work and management and maintenance and effort that doesn't ever mean you'll have like an easy, comfortable walk. So, uh, and then I'm gonna close it out with Scout. And Scout is uh, uh, one of my friend um, Tara Isaacson's um, dog. And uh, so Scout was a dog that we helped her with uh, through Q&A Saturday and, and I think some emails and phone calls and things like that. Um, she's also a T3 grad. And um, Scout was a dog that Tara did incredible amounts of work with. I mean, talk about, talk about a, just a resolute, you know, so much resolve with this with this woman about how hard she was going to work to help get Scout into a good place, and she worked her butt off, and 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 there was this kind of like progress and no um, progress and then uh, progress, and she was trying all the best tools and doing all the right stuff, and I know that she had a one percenter. I know it. I I know because I watched the videos she'd send. And I'd see the progress, but I'd also see what she was up against. And my heart went out for her because I knew that she was dealing with, which can be a real gift in a lot of ways because it will cause you to uh, raise your skill set level to an incredibly different, different space, but also give you appreciation for other people that might be struggling um, even though they're doing their best, which can be a really nice insight. It's real easy to be judgy um, until you've got a dog like that. That you, If you've never dealt with a dog like that, you've got no idea what it's like to have a one percenter and be trying to deal with it. So um, Scout was a dog that really, 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 really was challenging. And like I said, watching those videos, I was like, Phew, Man, my hat goes off to you for going out and working every day to try and make that a better situation. And um, so um, big, 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 big props to Tara for the work she did. And um, it's just those one percenters, guys. Um, they're out there and it doesn't make them bad dogs and it doesn't make them, doesn't make them dogs that, that, uh, that are bad eggs. You know what I mean? It just, there's something going on with them. And whether it's experiential stuff, nature, nurture, or a combination of the two, oftentimes we'll never know. Um, all we can do is do our best. And if we're lucky enough, that one percenter dog catches on to what's going on and is able to move down to the five, 10, 20, 30, 40%. And out of that, that, that kind of unfortunately rarefied air of, of being a one percenter. Um, but many of them can't. And, uh, so I shared some of these stories just so you guys would be aware of, um, the realities of this stuff. Um, I think that, that it's important that, and, and I want to add this one point, it's important important that we have some understanding for ourselves <clears throat> and others that we know that might be dealing with dogs like this but that doesn't mean that everybody's got a one percenter so if you're struggling with your dog I don't want you to automatically clock out now after watching this and go like I've got a one percenter so I, there's nothing I can do 
excuse me, like I said, if they're one percenters, they're really rare, really, really, really rare. So most likely for most people that aren't using e-collar and prong collar and haven't studied intensely how to work with reactivity stuff, you probably don't have a one percenter. You just don't have the right approach and tools going on to empower you to get what you want. So, um, and if you are using all those tools and all this great stuff and you've got help and you've studied and da 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 and you're still like just hitting that wall over and over again, then you very possibly do have a one percenter. So I wanted to just share that. And then I'm gonna close out the show talking about a video I put up the other day about how long it actually took me to train Bella. And it was kind of like a funny little kind of play on words where I was saying that I had lied, you know, about how long it took. And, and some people were like, oh, it's clickbait. I didn't mean it to be clickbait, but I really wanted it to have the emphasis and impact of, of, of people really wrapping their head around the fact that getting her to that place that quickly wasn't about magic that transpired magically within me um it was a and and i, I kind of closed the video out by saying you know it took 12 years to be able to change bella in 12 hours and that's something that people forget when they watch these before and after videos and they see amazing progress and they go oh my god and then they hold themselves to the same high standard and it's 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 an impossible standard to hold yourself to unless you've done all of this previous work that allows you to be in this position now to be able to understand tools, techniques, timing, approach, uh, switching it up, reading the dog, I, a multitude of 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 nuanced insights and understandings. Not to elevate myself or anybody else to like too exalted of a space, but you know what I'm saying. So. Um, I wanted to make sure that the before and after videos are serving the purpose that they're meant to, which is showing possibilities, showing the value of the tools, showing the value of the training, showing the great work that we can do, and encouraging people about possibilities rather than discouraging. I don't want those videos to be discouraging because if they're discouraging, it means that you're not being realistic in your viewing of them you're viewing your dog or you're viewing that video and then you're comparing your dog and yourself to the dog I'm working with and me or one of my trainers and it's an unfair comparison unless you've spent 12 15 20 years training dogs you haven't put in the time yet to be able to create those kind of changes that rapidly so those videos are meant to show what's possible but not to hold you to a standard timeline wise and and results wise that you should be able to achieve in the same amount of time like i said and i like that line it took 12 years to be able to get those kind of results in 12 hours it's really true and and once you can do that kind of stuff once you understand all that stuff then you can make things happen in, at, at a quicker pace and in a more profound fashion um but you don't get that stuff for free just like anything else in life it takes a whole hell of a lot of work in order to get there so um anyways i want to close with that and uh, hope you guys enjoyed this episode it's good to be back I missed you guys. Um, I felt terrible that we weren't there last week, um, but I know it was for a good cause. I know you're gonna love the audio book for those of you guys that are fans of the book and fans of audio. And um, so I hope you're all well, and I hope some of this information connects and, um, and helps you guys on your journey with your dogs. And um, we'll talk to you guys soon. Love you all, and uh, see you next week. Bye. Okay guys, we did it again. And guess who just woke up? He's awake. Um, thanks guys, and uh, we'll see you next week. Have a great one.